Congratulations. Hello, Spirits. Animated adult shows are probably some of the worst types of shows you could ever watch. Yeah, there are and were a few examples where adult shows like this don't tend to tread the same ground. Family Guy copied The Simpsons, and then we got an influx of Family Guy clones, and then we got Rick and Morty, and then people cloned their shows off of that, and so on, which ultimately left the creators of newer animated adult shows to decide the already popular art style they wanted to choose. But that's not to say something like Bojack Horseman or F is for Family is bad because of its lazy art style. I've seen clips of both shows and the shows have their stylistic moments but overall the storytelling is what they're both praised for. But in other cases we've got a recent show of better animation in terms of style and other elements that make good television. Velma is praised for its animation and that's it. Primal has really good animation, storytelling, and does rely on speaking, which leads me towards Amazon Originals. Amazon, while not a pristine company, I mean, what company is? But have recently been leading the charge in animated adult shows such as Pantheon, Legend of Vox Machinima, or the better known show, Invincible. But another show has been added to the roster, Hasbun Hotel. And have you ever just been following a show that just caught your attention for so long? Well, that's the scenario I'm in with Hasbun Hotel. Four years. I've been waiting four years for this show to say that this show inspired me is an understatement. Like the stills, there has been a hotel and hell of our exclusives. If I ever get to review that show. Now I've been vocal recently on my 2024 videos that the Nine Realms put me on this path. And they did, but Hasman Hotel played an even bigger factor in my art career. But also was my technical first video. Where 16 year old me was more insightful than the adult babies crying on Twitter right now. And before this ends, do not send hate towards anyone when and before Hasman Hotel hits. That includes Viv, her team, the new voice actors, etc. It's not your show, it's Viv's. Make it make sense. But I've been following the progress of Hasbun Hotel since then, and while I wasn't a fan of it immediately, quite frankly I'd been a lot of things I wouldn't want to be, much less would I have any job pathways to follow. But it's finally time to sit down and discuss Hasbun Hotel, and quite frankly I have a lot to say about this show. I mean positively. So did you hate this thing I was going to shit talk this show? On that, I don't want to hear any sort of blind hate for the show, Viv or her team, because I am not going to hide the fact I will delete your comment. You can critique my channel, this video, and the show as long as you're fucking respectful about it. And provide at least some reasonable points to why you don't like it. Not just some baseless allegations about Sir Pengius based on his ex-friend. Accusations proven false provided by a stalker. If you're on Twitter, you know the fucking moron I'm talking about. Now you can say you hate the show. I won't delete your comment for that, but Christ, even on Twitter, when you say how you love animation, all of the comments are just hate, hate, hate. Anyways, without further ado, Hasman Hotel Season 1, full swing into things. To go through this quickly and to talk about the animation for a bit, originally when it was announced that Bento Box would be the studio that was going to work on the show, it uh, freaked a lot of people out, me as well. Understandably, Bento Box was known for animating some of the worst animated adult shows then and now. I'm not kidding, Mulligan, Craftopolis. Make them up! That's childish. I'm childish. Daddy needy deety. Daddy needy deety. The Prince, Housebroken, Hoot, and the same three shows made by two dumbasses. God, I hate these two idiots. Three shows, and they made crap each time. Again, I recommend these videos. And Bento was unfortunately go-to studio for crappy animated adult comedies. Which really does just suck, and even though Bob's Burgers was the only good show they animated, the animation style didn't look like it would complement Viv's style. And a lot of people saying that they thought from Happy Day in Hell, the animation was a mixture of hand-drawn and puppet animation. It wasn't. However, with the small show of Kiki flying to the composition from Alistair, showed that uh, the, f the show was in good hands. Especially when early in that same year the Bolt's Burgers film came out with fantastic animation. Fuck, I really should get to watching that. And you'll see through my review of the animation it contains, but 
I love how much of the show uses of lighting, gradients, fluid animation designs, and even small background details, it's, it's all so perfect. And yeah, you have animation errors, but what, what show doesn't? I honestly can't wait to see what more will come from this because this is so godly for television. And speaking from experience, through the show it has been some of the best animation I've ever seen. Especially from a studio who's hired out to make some of the worst looking shows in animation history. But you insisted on this noisy picture box advertisement. But this is why I think if you give Bento time, you give them a budget and someone with creativity, then they can create some good shit. And I'm not saying Viv's a saint, but every time Bento is given animation to, it's just so god awful. So I'm hoping in the future people will later respect Bento for Bob's Burgers and Haspen Hotel. Yes, yeah, so I've had to put in three disclaimers. To get this out of the way with the voice acting, everyone does a great job at providing a new version of the pilot voice, or giving the character a voice outside the fanon voices. However, I do find it fine if anyone was skeptical on the voices. But once the clips rolled in, it was pretty clear the voices are either fine or even better than the originals. However, that saying, I do want to mention that I'm not really a fan of Vaggie's singing voice. While Stephanie's singing isn't bad in any way, it's actually really good. It's just not suited for the lower tone Vaggie's voice is perceived to be. You oh, wait, wait! I can't fight without my minions! Are gonna survive together! Ah! And you are gonna make this hotel work! And I'm hoping that her singing voice will change over time to fit with the character she voices. And that's not to say that the work of the pilot actors means nothing. They provided the kind of voice Viv was striking for for her characters at the time. That's kind of the point of a pilot. No bar, no alcohol. This is supposed to be a place that discourages sin! Not some kind of mouth. Brothel man Shut up. Next to nothing will remain the same, and sometimes it's the animation, the character, or the character design, and much more. That's... well, look at Hasbro Hotel. Heck, I've changed my character designs a couple times. Pilots that turn into full-fledged series change the most of the time. Fit something better, and that's the same with voice actors. Your magic. Ooh. Magic. What every actor did on the pilot will never be forgotten. They gave life to these characters that you love so much. They provided moments on stream, lines in the runtime. The void. <clears throat> and Viv made the decision for it was time for all that in the past the mantle to someone else. By the way, the decision was to make the show more Broadway, with every actor being a part of one or another. It's a wild so. series, and it's so—it's just it's so much fun. I'm so happy it's doing so well too, you know. And, and the music too. I, I keep getting notifications that Poison is on like this playlist and this playlist. Hey. And Spotify playlist. And it's not like the pilot actors loathe the new ones. Ed Bosco and Amira in the same photo. Oh no. What do you know? The same thing happened to Michael and Blake. Michael literally gave him a free Fat Nuggets plush. Michael hates Blake my fucking ass. And it's not like any of the pilot actors are out of a job either. To name a few, Michael the voice of Angel Dust went on to voice characters such as N, Jax, Fantokio. Ed the voice of Alistair now voices Stryker in Hell of a Boss Season 2. Thea, the voice of Katie Kiljoy was the twin Envium to Glitz and Glam in Hell of a Boss. And a few background voices such as this demon was James Monroe Iwerhart, who went on to be the voice of Vortex and Oh, I don't know, fucking Asmodeus in Hell of a Boss. And in the Hasbun show, it's the Overlord Zestial. And just so much more. But while it is fine to feel weary on how each character sounds, because I get it at first, I really wasn't sure with Husk and his one-liner in the trailer, but then the Husker Dust clip came in and... Yeah, perfect fit for him. And it's the same with the rest of the series. However, um... I'm not really fully set on the voices of Katie and Tom. Brandon's voice works for her, but... Tom's doesn't, and that's only basing it on not really a lot of lines. You won't forget the pilot actors. I won't, and a lot of new fans may even discover the older ones later in the future. I wish he'd shoot 
me with his ray gun. But if you want to support the pilot VAs, don't say they were mistreated or they deserve better because they've had roles in other projects before has been and after has been. Support the new roles they take on, don't cling to them. But just a quick thing, I love Amir Talai as Alistair. Again, I love every pilot actor including Ed as Al and Gabe who gave us the singing voice. But holy fuck, Amir is actually my favourite actor in the entire show and he does such a great job with Alistair. Like, some of the delivery he gives is fucking fantastic. Nope. I guess that's why Charlie called it the has-been hotel. Ha ha ha! Ha ha It was actually my idea. Ha <laughs> ha Well, it's not very clever! Ha <laughs> ha! Fuck you. I know something you don't know. If you ever say that again, I will tear your soul apart and broadcast your screams for every other disrespectful wretch who dares to question me. Understood. Lovely. <laughs> good talk, my good man. Always nice to catch up. Probably more I can say, but I can really tell that the actors love the characters they play. So please, give them a chance, and you may actually like them. That was a productive meeting. Now it's been confirmed that the Vs are the villains for next season, and honestly I'd love to see more of these bastards. Each of the characters defies a moral or ethical standard between characters. Vox controls the advertisements and broadcasts, Valentina controls the porn industry, and Velva controls the fashion trends and social media. And I love that each of them affects a character or two depending on their situation. Vox is connected to Alistair as he was a past friend to him. Only something tore their friendship up which led to Vox upgrading himself or even upgrading himself was the problem and he became too modern for Alistair. And Vox isn't ultimately useless due to his rivalry with Alistair, he sends someone to make sure he doesn't grow any more powerful with Charlie's soul. Why? <laughs> in which the V send out Serpentius, who, in the end, becomes a cast member and brings along his egg boys who, what are you surprised, also serve purposes. Velvet is a new generation of the Overlord, so she's gonna be a lot more bratty and hot-headed when it comes to attack plans while Camilla and the other overlords go for defensive tactics because that's worked. Come up with a full assault plan. And they don't have a lot of intel to go off of. And later on we discover that if hell new angelic weapons were the way to fight, it could threaten Camilla's family and people. And while, yeah, any other demon could have shown that he found an exorcist's head, it means nothing in the runtime to other characters because they don't know who did it or an idea of who. Angel and Hus could have found a head and Charlie could have been looking into how to kill an angel, but they wouldn't have gotten anyway because of the other characters influencing the steps along the way. Velvet found it and presented it to the overlords in hoping they would take action, only to come out and deduce that from how Camilla acted as if she knew more in which Alistair caught on to that fact and he used Sir Pentius' egg boys to spy on Camilla and get the answer he needed. Leading to the deal with Charlie and then to leading it to Rosie's people. And again, it's the same with Alistair who's similar to how the Viz are in the show's events. Al's shtick is that he's a deal-based overlord, who owns the soul of anyone just as long as they get their end of the deal. And it can be as small as pieces of information to keep in the power they once had. This influences the events of Hus talking to Angel, he's not alone. And again, if his status of an overlord wasn't in play, then we wouldn't have had the idea Alistair is tied to another character, much less we knew about the Exorcist. Plus, if you had to guess which character killed an Exorcist, who would you guess out of the hundreds of thousands of years it's never happened? You wouldn't guess someone like Camilla, who's been around for, assumingly, a longer period, and probably expect someone new. And later on, it's confirmed he made a deal himself in Episode 5, that it greatly affects him in the finale. He's at the hotel for a reason, and, and while it may not be for selflessness, even the artist Mumatsi brought up that during Alistair's part of the song in the finale, there are eyes everywhere he's in, suggesting further that whoever this person he signed a deal with is watching Alistair. And honestly, I'm thinking it's Rue, or Rue is Eve, since Rue design has a heavily inspiration of Eldritch Horror, and one of her few existent drawings has the eyes across all over her tongue but also other eyes are in other corners of places Al's not even in, so it could even stretch past Al. Sorry, I just had a lot to say there. <laughs>
And then you have Valentino, who has a bigger role because of all the free Vs, since he has a bigger connection to the Hasman Hotel member, Angel. To not go too long on this, because there's an entire section dedicated to that at the end, Angel has a deal with Val where he has to do whatever he says which connects to characters like Husk, who's in that same boat. So while the Vs may not have been the main villains, they're sort of like a domino effect. While small, Velvet and Vox help with the plot in meaningful ways. Take Pentius, because Pentius would have kept repeatedly attacking the hotel. He wouldn't have had a reason to stay in the hotel. Why seek redemption without a purpose? That's what every other sinner is doing, no matter what their sin is. Not a single new recruit. Yeah, well. Who would want to use their last days not fucking and fighting? Even Angel is staying there just for the free room and not for redemption until later. And the rest of the hotel, mainly Alistar, wouldn't have known they had a chance to kill Angels without Velvet. And their roles in Season 2 are only going to be heightened as I said before. Because in Season 2 and hopefully later, we will get to see the stories of characters like Lilith, Nifty, Cherry and maybe the other characters yet to be added. No! 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 Stay! Wait, where'd you get that piano? But yeah, while the show to me was pretty good, the show does rush through some things enough that it doesn't feel like it's been that period of time. Now to make it clear, this isn't something that Viv could really control. Viv tried to get all the things she wanted to set up for later seasons while trying to tell a story, because Amazon's to blame. With only 8 episodes, unfortunately, you can only do so much and make it feel genuine. Now, to make it so you guys can follow along with the next point, and hopefully know what I'm talking about, Episode 1 introduces the seasoned villains, Adam and Loot, who reveal to Charlie that extermination is coming in 6 months rather than a year. Extermination is when angels called the exorcist from hell kill demons to lessen up on their population. Well, Adam, sir. Mr. Adam, sir. Call me Dick Master. Adam. Episode 2 is about Serpentius acting as a new resident at the hotel for redemption, and as a spy for the Vs, before being caught and added as a new permanent cast member for the hotel. Agent Pentius in need of immediate evacuation! Pentius, wait. Episode 3 is about Vaggie trying to prove her worth to Charlie, even if her methods are questionable because of the trust they have, while Alistair attends an overlord meeting and finds out Camilla killed an angel. Alistair? Yes, I know. I've been absent some time. I'm sure you've all been wondering. Not really. Episode 4 is about Charlie learning that she can't fix every problem with how her actions made Angel's work life harder with his boss Valentino. And with us showing that Angel isn't the only one locked in a contract. And Nifty? Yeah. You don't even want to know what her deal is. Episode 5 is about Lucifer visiting his daughter at the hotel, with Charlie hoping she can get a meeting with Heaven. Me in trouble with some loan sharks I may or may not have borrowed 50 grand from her. Episode 6 is about Charlie in a court of law in heaven, hoping to show that redemption is possible, and bringing to light that angels don't know what redeems a soul, and that her patron, Angel, did everything right in that moment before being told the hotel is first. Ah! Episode 7 is about Charlie learning Camilla killed an angel, and beginning to scrape together Cannibal Town as an army, while Vaggie trains with Carmilla to fight against angels. Where's the showmanship? Episode 8 is about fighting off angels and saving hell before rebuilding the hotel. And now, I am going to fuck you! Well, this just got interesting. It's fuck you up, Dad. Wait, what did I say? Now, one of those issues stems from that the friendship that Angel, Husk, and Sir Pentius share in Episode 3. Now, at first, it doesn't come off as their friendship is something that happened fluidly, because they just established that they respect Pentius after seeing him in battle, only... We never saw him fight, and that they've grown a bond from it. And yeah, it's a problem I have with only that part of their friendship, the setup. We only saw Angel pulling Pentius upstairs, and thankfully later on, their friendship does feel more natural, and that's something that will repeat again with something I'll get into in a second. But I feel like if we saw some of them fighting during whatever it takes, instead of just fighting off screen, it could have been more natural. I'm supposed to never fail you. I blame you for this, you crazy bitch! Because I like that Husk appreciated Pentius that he could fight, but fuck, I don't like that they had to be told that they formed their friendship from it. But I think the moments that came as the episodes followed showed that they all had a bond, and weren't excluding him from anything. Pussy! Especially with how Angel was the first to find him out as the spy. However, the next thing that I was talking about, which was Alistair having dad beef with Lucifer coming out of nowhere, 
And yeah, I was confused on that one as well. However, there was a deliberate reason why. During the song Hell's Greatest Dad, there wasn't any build up that Alistair was a father figure to Charlie and felt more akin to of Nifty. However, after that song and during more than anything, Charlie and Lucifer make up and tell that he hasn't been involved with her life mainly to, due to losing his dreams. And during the end, Alistair is looking at it Alistair and Charlie proudly, not angry or a face of jealousy. He had a plan to get Lucifer to agree to a deal by stepping up as a father, with how he refused to let Charlie go to heaven. He's done it once himself and failed. He didn't want Charlie to go through that all over again. And this was something a user brought up that I cannot find the act to. But they have brought up this detail because while it wasn't explained to us through writing, and honestly it's something I appreciate because even if you have to be paying close attention or even watch multiple times to get it, Really good idea and heaven is bound to agree if I get the chance to talk to them. And even before the song started, Alistair found that merely touching Charlie's shoulder would piss Lucifer off, so he used that angle against him to blindside Lucifer into giving that meeting. And it's the same with another detail someone else caught. And eventually the Hasbun Hotel account tweeted that out, with Sir Pentius confessing his feelings for Charlie could have amounted to simply being set up in the previous episode. Do a sex with me. <laughs> A background detail we see is Penji is explaining his crush on Cherry to Charlie, who when he tries to confess, Charlie's in the back being a Cherry snake shipper. And another detail I do know who pointed this one out was Tech Wastro. In hindsight, I should have used their usernames and not their handles. Spotted the detail that Kiki had grown fond of Pentius, and even other moments before that as well, even realising what happened to him. It's these sorts of details I like because it just lets the viewers infer things instead of just not trusting your audience to point out what exactly happened. Oh no. No 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 Charlie, no no no. That's uh no. And the other other issue I have with the show is was the time frame. Now I understand that with eight episodes, the last three within a couple days, it's hard to convey a redemption, extermination, and how this has broken Charlie in that period. Because from the continuity, episode one is a week after the pilot, episode two wouldn't have been long after that, episode three is a week after episode two, and then episode five is five months later, and yeah. Which was a very big surprise when even if one episode released a week, that may have given it that edge. But something Venus on Twitter pointed out was that the episodes led up with each month. And honestly that makes it appear a lot better and make a lot more sense. But again, this was mainly an issue by Amazon because if it had more episodes, it would have filled in the blanks. Especially for characters I'll get to, a small character I'll mention however, that's affected by the shorter episodes was Emily. And that's all I'll say for now. I think the show does a good enough job of not bloating the audience full of exposition, lore, and a lot of the characters. Some of the uh, other characters that are eventually and hopefully going to be added like Baxter or Arachnus. Because in the two minute opening they give us a storytelling of how hell came to be. But this also sets up the motivation and conflicts between the characters Sarah, Adam, Lilith, Lucifer, Charlie, and the start of extermination. Instead of just showing a lazy text while circling around town, explaining everyone's roles, their powers, blah blah blah, bad story. Telling. They set up heaven as a privileged place that acts similar to hell, a city of winners and heavenborns. Winners are human souls who are worthy of going to heaven by the way, or assumingly more places such as Cherub Town and Hill of a Boss. And I say privileged because heaven shows that it isn't perfect, and that rules up there need to be followed to the letter. This is in cases like Lucifer who's been directly hurt by how heaven treated his dreams before they faded away. Leaving him with the distaste of heaven and human souls who he found gained free will and created a dystopian in the kingdom he rules. And in episode 5, he tried to cement that reasoning into Charlie because he doesn't want her dreams to be hurt, or for her to be killed by them, only leading further into the deal made by Heaven and Lucifer. But in the end, it just led to him disconnecting himself from his family, the place he created, and the dreams that were only reignited with the chain reaction of his daughter. But with the idea of Charlie's hotel making it seem like souls could possibly be redeemed could threaten how Heaven works and that hell could rebel against heaven. And then in episode 6, the question is posed that has an answer, but at the same time isn't the right one. Why wasn't Angel Dust in heaven? While watching him, he checked all the boxes that would let a soul be redeemed. How does a soul get into heaven? A question that answers itself because the angels don't know the answer. They don't know how a soul is redeemed just as much as Charlie didn't. Inspiring the song, you didn't know. However, I must bring up another issue with this. A problem I've brought up in my Nine Realms video, plural, 
Is introducing things never seen before and making it a big thing, or a useless thing to include? Such as in the final season, they introduce the main character's ancestor's mother. Can I, can I say Valka? You guys know who Valka is, right? Anyways, the main character found and trained with that staff, only to have it broken in all of one episode. And an issue like that comes in the form of Emily. Emily is an angel that's immediately a reflection of Charlie, only if she was angelic. She's energetic, happy, and the leading voice in their causes. However, the problem isn't Viv's fault again, is that Emily in the same episode she debuts in, is revealed that angels outside of exorcists go down and kill them. And that only Sarah knew about the extermination of how many years it's been going on for. Who excuses its existence as required because she doesn't see herself as evil. But what she endorses is tenfold worse than what any sin has done down there. Killing hundreds of thousands to millions of souls, all because she thought they rebelled, and Adam's way of doing things just to get back at Lucifer, in which the better parts of the song from You Didn't Know come to take form. While it means that now one of Hell's voices is now on heaven, the problem stems from A, being her first appearance, B, never sending it out that exorcists are the only ones to know. But I think Viv did alright with getting all the essential details set up and spaced it all out together. There's only so much you can include and can't do, and but an, <sighs> but an extra episode would have been nice to see from the perspective of Emily or Heaven as a whole and Sarah just being more vague and hidden of what she's actually hiding. As this would have set up the angels outside exterminators don't know about it. Because on its own it has a good impactful hit to it. But it could have been bigger when Welcome to Heaven arrived since the reveal would have been more meaningful. The only difference with the Nine Realms is that they do this multiple times and do things that don't impact to anything. While at least with Emily's reveal it will have a payoff in the coming seasons. Especially with her little squeak at the end for something I'll talk about later. <laughs> But to talk about the song you didn't know quickly, recently as of early February, people didn't know what this lyric meant. And on its own, maybe I could see how they'd be confused, but they'd have to listen to it for not even like 10 seconds to explain it in song. If hell is forever, then heaven must be a lie is a powerful line in the show because it shows the entire purpose and conflict of the show. If an angel does something wrong, they remain in the sky, and that's because of the extermination of souls who can be redeemed. I'll talk about rehabilitation in a bit, but with this episode, it shows that heaven isn't as perfect as it's made out to be, because in the inner circle, it's flawed as much as the sinners that they kill. Sarah is responsible for giving in to Adam's idea of an extermination just because it was to keep them from rebelling with angels following his command without a second thought outside of another important character in the show. Angels are just as bad because they don't just do some of the bad stuff down there. Red Badgie's cut mouth out her ass! You just, just chill, loot, fuck. Then there's the other angels such as Adam again, and that enjoy taking the lives of Hell's denizens instead of helping with the population who interpret it as entertainment. And they're open about it, Adam is a clear show of being the first man that has its downsides to how they will act. Because he's a douche, an arsehole, and sure not to be worthy of the power he holds because I'm fucking Adam, I'm the original dick. He was the first man to step through heaven's gates, which he even questioned Sarah that it's true. Sure got me here, didn't it? <laughs> Right, Sarah? He was the first human soul in heaven. He is a character who solemnly believes he deserves more than he gets, and that demon should be kneeling before him. While the majority of the demons who stood up to him are fighting out of love for one another. They've killed sinners for god knows how long, and when they finally beat Adam, he never breaks his mask because they're one of the same. Because his only importance to himself, his only status and purpose, and he clings to that ideology most of the time he's on screen. He doesn't use any other reason to justify his existence, besides one of the factors towards how humans look. Even when he's hooking up with others, he uses it as a reason. The reason this virtue chick was digging on the drummer, and it's like, do you know who I am? I'm fucking Adam. I'm the original dick. All dicks descend from me. And I'm hoping we get more of him as there's been speculation that he's become a sinner now after he died. Because something that's never happened before is Adam's mask glitching when he touches Charlie. Because in episode one, it's established that either hellborn or demons like Charlie can't be hurt during exterminations. And his mask never glitches prior into touching the only hellborn within the group, other than Lucifer. <laughs> Fuck, that's, a, that's such a funny clip. Also, I find it funny and at the same time weird that instead of saying he looks like his voice actor, he looks like...
A big part of the show is redemption, and while that's mainly for sinners, it relates to the characters that need it the most. Now, Sir Pentius is my favourite character because he's such a goober. Episode 2 is basically the setup to a redemption arc towards Sir Pentius, with his desire to be respected, praised, and shown compassion even when he did wrong. And this is apparent with the now non-canon Instagram post back in the day where Sir Pentius was sucking up to Vox and Val, and it's the same here. We was hoped that he'd be employed by them, or even by them, or even by their side. I like how we were led to believe Angel was the one who was going to be redeemed because he's the only candidate, but with Pentius' debut, it shows that Angel doesn't care much for the hotel or redemption, he's only staying there for the room and board. I much prefer Pentius as a character who accepts redemption instead of being a villain of the week. It would have made him repetitive, especially with Alistair's presence, he can't really win. Thank you for letting your guard down! Ah, ah. Oh shit! So it would have been a waste of a character to use. And with characters like Pentius, there's also a great divide of those who deserve heaven and those who don't judging by their actions. What can I do for such a... Ah, oh, no thank you. Characters like Pentius was redeemed because he changed the fit norm for the redeemed. No weapons, nicer to others, he changed his ways of villainy because he was being treated as he wanted to. Being treated as someone in a family, as a friend, well before he was hated on and treated like a joke, so much so when he was caught. Where Vox basically told him to kill himself. It's a favor. If they don't kill you, go ahead and do it yourself, you miserable failure! And in the end, Pentius does something selfless. A long shot because he kissed Cherry just in case. Sacrificing himself to save his friends, even if there was a chance that he would die in the end. While admittedly, <laughs> while admittedly his death is pretty funny, I get why it was written like that, because in the end, he was redeemed. So his death up until that point wouldn't have been taken seriously, while it impacts the characters indefinitely. Then there are other characters like Rosie who, yeah, give good advice to Charlie, but because of Rosie being a cannibal, who most likely can't be redeemed unless she gives that up. Also, just to, you know, thin out the air, I'm not entirely sure if she's a Hellborn or a Sinner, but Hellborns are typically nicer, so... Then there's also the possibility that for demons to be redeemed, they need to feel accomplished and in the end, they have to be killed to test if they're really worthy of being redeemed. Because that's all we can go off of. Angel in episode 6, for example, did everything to change from how Angel would normally act. Do drugs, forget about the others around him, submit to Valentino and have a good night. But because of Charlie's hotel, husk ground in nature, he changed his ways. Only he wasn't sent to heaven, he wasn't redeemed either, because he needs to die to prove it, or he doesn't feel ready to be redeemed. And that's evident with how he treats the activities Charlie sets up to be redeemed. He doesn't really care for them, and sometimes other characters are already redeemed or are close to redemption by how they act. Again, clips of Sir Pentius and Kiki, she grew close to Pentius, and a lot to speculate his soul had already been redeemed at that point. And then there's Vaggy, who is a decent show of a character who's flawed. If you didn't know already, it's revealed that Vaggy was an exorcist angel. Wait, you know I'm an exorcist? How? You have a giant X over your eye and wield an angelic spear. It's not rocket science. That was considered Volum because she let a demon child go. However, this isn't revealed to anyone other than Adam and Lute who knew who she was because they fought alongside her. And at the end, Charlie finds out the secret which breaks her. And in episode 7, her thoughts are all jumbled because of everything. The hotel's gonna be destroyed, the residents will be killed, all of hell will be killed, her girlfriend was an exorcist and much more. And they didn't need to show Charlie and Vaggy working it out because it was never in Charlie's nature. Because in the end, she needed another voice to straighten it out, which is Rosie's role. I won't set it up, I'll, I'll just show it. If there's anything I've learned, it's that words are cheap, but actions, they speak the truth. So, what have her actions said? That she believes in me and what we're doing. <laughs> right now, she's off learning how to protect everything we've worked for. And by the end, they make up because 
Charlie can tell by Vaggie's actions she supports what she does, and doesn't plan to repeat what she did. Which strengthens their bond as the last episode goes by, and season 2 will most likely test it as well. To add on, and well, end this segment, I should mention that I'm hoping a lot of this lore will be further explained in season 2 or later. There's things in the show with mainly about Vaggie. How did she get her wings back? Is Vaggie a heavenborn or a human? Why did Adam get to name Vaggie? And there's a lot more I could probably bring up, like Alistair taking deals but not with souls, which they make obvious. But from what I've seen, the show uses details to set up later episodes in more seasons, and most of these can be open to interpretation until an answer can be confirmed. Like again with the mask glitching right before they were defeated or killed. So while not everything is clear, we only have a single season, and there's more to come in terms of everything and everyone. So who knows, there may be more behind some of these themes. All I want is potato chips. I think something people don't know about Hasbun Hotel is that they think it's satanic because it has demons. While the only one at fault here is, well, the parents who bring more attention to the show and make an uproar about it. You know, instead of just not letting their kids watch it. It's okay, it's just one little prick, you won't feel it. Ew, don't say that, it sounds vulgar. Excuse me. Pervert. What I think people don't get is that this is a show about demons rehabilitating themselves to be good. Weirdly enough, I, I don't know why, but it kind of sounds like a church. Hear me out to the specific group of religious nuts that's mixed in the one with actual thoughts. Because don't people of sin come into a church to replenish their sin by redeeming themselves to the Lord? Oh, but they're sinful souls. It must mean they can't better themselves depending on what they did. I wonder if that's why Sarah's written like that. Every sinner soul in Hasbun Hotel, it's never presented as someone who's good of heart. They all have their flaws and baggage. For example, on the show, Camilla Carmine has a family, protects her people, while at the same time is an overlord who are a group of people who control the souls of others outside, I think Rosa. Whoever her people are, are under a contract like any other, and Carmilla's additional sin is selling angelic weapons, and weapons in general. And who knows, there even may be more behind the walls of Carmine's home. Nifty is shown to be psychotic all the way through, has no sense of boundaries or even special awareness. Tonight, however you want, because we're all gonna die! Alright, let's give it up for not dying! She isn't like Serpentius, who I've already explained was redeemed. However, just because there are bad people doesn't mean they can't have their moments of good and bad. In episode 5, I briefly mentioned that Alistair helped Charlie and Lucifer make up. To finally put a face to the name, you are much shorter in real life! And through that entire episode, Lucifer was being shown around the hotel, but his mind had always been made up that he wouldn't help out Charlie. His dreams had been crushed by heaven and he viewed every sinner as awful beings not deserving of their free will. And he actively tries to dance around the problems he has around it, because he's trying to protect and shelter Charlie as much as possible. Only due to the dreams she's seen from him, she wasn't going to stop. And due to some sheltering as a kid, she's grown up believing mistakes can be fixed every time. Which later on in episode 4, she's learned at the start of her growth. But the moment they both share is fantastic, because Charlie's living in the stories her father had taught her during the song more than anything. And honestly, I can't wait to see more of Lucifer if he does make it out in the end. Another is some of the moments with Charlie and Baggy, one of which is when Charlie cries outside Angel's room, knowing that there may be a chance her friends could die, as well as every denizen in hell. With Baggy singing the Charlie reprised version of More Than Anything, and I find it really symbolic, it's both sung by Charlie's loved ones who have both fallen from heaven, telling Charlie that she's done so much for so many, changing the lives of others such as Angel, Husk, and Pentius, and in the end, if it's only Baggy she saved, then they love each other more than anything. Because Vaggie's trying to redeem herself, especially with all the time she has spent with Charlie supporting her. She's flawed like every other sinner, even with her past sins that she's not proud of. And this is after the reveal of Vaggie as an angel, which I've already explained when Rosie gave her that advice. And remember, just because this is an adult show on hell, doesn't mean it's supporting hell propaganda. Another Amazon original show, Invincible, Huh, has a demon who explicitly mentions from hell, and was even sent back to hell. The characters are bad because that's the point of the show. They're bad characters, but that doesn't mean they're all bad. A lot of characters can have their humane feelings, but how they perform them may not be deemed heavenly. If you're an adult, 
Watch the show as it is, not just as a demon show. Instead, listen to the stories they're trying to tell like any other film that you perceive as for kids. And for God's sake, not with your fucking kid. Just a quick thing with the music. The music in Has Been Hotel is fantastic. I'm personally a fan of every song in the show, including Welcome to Heaven. I love a lot of the duets, foreshadowing in, such with every song. Especially everyone's singing voice that comes along with it. But I also love how that most of the songs basically explain the motivations behind a character. It's written to be like that. Happy day in hell is Charlie, well, wanting the fighting to stop with heaven so she can focus on rehabilitation. Hell is forever is Adam and Lude expressing that hell is forever with the rules of heaven and hell working like black and white, while also showing the conflict for the rest of the season. Whatever it takes is about Carmilla and Vaggie wanting to protect their loved ones in different ways. And just a lot more. Even Welcome to Heaven shows that Heaven thinks proudly of themselves and doesn't want hellish rubble in their domain. But something like that just didn't click with others. Though upon rewatch there are obviously some things wrong with the show, but mainly for the song Out of Love, the problem stems from yeah, a main theme and purpose to why the characters won was out for love. But the problem is, Vaggy was never shown to be very bloodthirsty, and even when she was alone and outed in front of Adam and Loot. Loot being the one who stripped Vaggy of her angelic status by cutting out her eye and wings. And I feel like if Vaggy was a lot more pissed off in that episode, it could have made the message Camilla was singing more meaningful. Because again, I love every song, but out for love just doesn't make sense, but makes up for being... Well, a good song. Yes, you cannot like a song, but to not at least get why they're doing it, that's a red flag. The final one. Now, I went off on the premiere date on Twitter and it just really piss me the fuck off. Oh, not the scene, but the idiots who said otherwise. I'll play some of my audio from that as well a little later, but this entire episode is called Masquerade, another word for mask, or another way to hide one's identity or emotions. And do you know what victims of sexual assault do? They cope, try to get over it and get better, but most can't escape the trauma they went through or are currently going through. When people attacked Hasman Hotel and insulted the sexual assault scene, misunderstanding Angel's character, these people showed their true feelings towards anyone with that kind of trauma. Victims of sexual assault. Through episode 4, we're shown the true extent behind Angel's character, who he is, how he is. A porn star who takes pride in the work he does, but in other episodes, he's flirty and seductive to Alistair and especially Husk the only character to understand what Angel is truly going through. What Charlie thinks is daily work is daily servitude, and when Pentius is appreciated by the others, no one stops to comfort Angel as he storms off and listens to the abusive and manipulative messages Val leaves him. And again, Masquerade is the perfect episode to break that mask with Husk, being the only one to know what he's going through. While he flirts with Husk, he points out he knows that he's fake because he's in the same boat. Only Husk doesn't try to hide the ball and chain. He knows that behind that sex and flirty persona is a man trying to put on a facade for everyone around him. And that works because no one in the hotel suspects Valentino as a creep, an abuser. And then we're shown how Angel mixing himself and Val is different when it's someone he knows interacting with him. He doesn't want Charlie to know what he's going through, much less the kind of boss he has in comparison to how he plays it up. Because I could make you a star, make us both richer than, well, your papito. Fuck no! Uh, and Charlie going only makes it worse for Angel, leading him to kick her out. But back on the topic, because After Charlie Leaves is the second song revealed to us before its release. Poison. Through the song Poison, we're shown the regular life of Angel, being fucked constantly by any demon looking to score time with him on camera, including the sexual assault scene between Angel and Val. And unlike how people were talking about it, it's taken seriously. The scene is quick and brief, they flash it to it in between other parts of the sex life he has. 
but it shows that Angel is constantly being used as Val's favourite toy whenever he can, being fed metaphorical poison that leads Angel only furthering to despise Val. And that's evident in episode 6 where he stands up to Val and reveals he can only do what he wants in the studio, but nothing outside. Which only leads to harsher implied punishment. It shows that Val has so much power over him because no matter what happens, his contract can never run out and he will never be free. And so, through all that pain, he puts on a mask. A mask that hides how he truly feels. And there's one person who can see right through him. Husk is the perfect character to show a parallel between their stories. Through and through, Husk and Angel are one of the same. They both sign their souls away and are forever under that overlord's mercy. For Angel, it's worse. For Husk, he gambled it away. His power, souls, he was once an overlord. Only to keep his power because he had to make a deal with Alistar. And if he steps out of line, the screens through the radio will be that of him. So Huss knows that, but again, he doesn't try hiding that he's bound to Alistar, that he's a gambling drunk. He knows what kind of arrangement he's in and can never leave, and knows he can never get out of it. An angel who's constantly flirting with him, doing drugs, drinking, he knows it's a way of coping. And so as Angel he's about to be drunk and drugged by some random sinners, Husk helps him and it's where he learned it's not a facade. It's who he needs to be for the public. For the actors, for Valentino, he tries to look like he's fine to everyone around him when he really isn't. He hopes to drug himself out of his life, that everything and anything that happens to him, to where he just breaks. Thinking how much he can be on drugs and having as much sex as he wants because without the thought of the source of his pain conflicting his every step. And then he feels Val will finally move on to a new toy. And then Huss tells his story of how he was an overlord who gambled his freedom away. And just like him, they're similar. To which a new song plays, Loser Baby. While Husk is calling Angel a loser, he does it from only the part of the story he knows about, that he should embrace his sexuality to reclaim his life back. But he's not just insulting Angel, he's insulting himself. They're in the same situation, but their only difference is, is that they're being tied differently to their oppressors. The song basically shows that you should be yourself, and not think you can't look for support to help you through it. Even if you're a loser in that way. Husk is a gambling drunk, and Angel's a sex-loving hoe. But that's what happens to them to make them not alone, and there's others like him well, like themselves. This is why I said that I'm not happy that people took an out of context scene and showed their true colors to survivors. Are we frank? I'm not a survivor. I've never looked too deeply into it, but my first thought is how can anyone just recover from such a thing? It takes work and I admire those who come back from it, even when they're still feeling that same trauma. Now I'm not a survivor. I cannot understand what people go through, but I know that they all have different ways of coping. They all have different ways of hiding it away or getting better. And some don't even recover. And I'm sorry to all those people who go through that. Because it's fucked. It's miraculous when people can overcome those thoughts. But I'm glad they do. And I'm glad others find a way to cope through it. To end this section and last video point. Because I saw some controversy behind this. And... There is a fine line between when a person, scene, or show is being fetishized, and when it's being represented in a meaningful way. When the episodes were leaked, there was one person alluding to a scene of being sexually assaulted, and quite frankly, I don't think it's much of a stretch to say who was the abuser and who was the fucking victim. And apparently that clip everyone saw was this. You cannot just take one scene from a song that just has only that, and that's it. Watch the entire episode, and it's so clear what this episode was trying to do. And it's so obvious that people just took that one scene at point blank and didn't watch the rest of it, or didn't assume that there's probably more to that scene. And I get that it looks like a finish, but at the same time, they're in a fucking porn studio. They're going to use all these sorts of porn related toys, outfits, and it's not even the worst off sexual assault scene. Then again, people will get mad at anything. Well, I mean, people got mad that Adam was a white man. Oh, uh, ugly people? But when you're tackling sexual assault as a theme, that's a big part of Angel Dust's character. 
I get where people are coming from. I know that they want to have the most, like, great representation just to show how uncomfortable it is because it's much worse when you're actually having it. It isn't a fetish, it isn't some rape kink. It's a character who a lot right now, in the past and in the future, will be in his situation. But it was written and performed amazing. Take Attic for a moment. Attic wasn't a song written by Viv, rather by Silverhound. But it was written and performed amazing enough where it's perfectly encapsulated Angel Dust's driving point. And it's the same case with Paranoid DJ's song on Stolas years prior. I see a lot of people point out how the crew in the show made fun of Angel Dust's abuse and they wrote Manticize Valentina when... I don't think we watched the same show. The same music video. The, the same pilot. Because you find if you find anything in this show hot, a character like this, a character like that, a scene of rape, then I guess it's what you find exciting. Yeah, apparently it's fetishized and uh... Yeah, if you find that hot, that's saying more about you than it's saying about his creator. Because I've heard how it's not easy for most to watch, and yeah, that's the- it, it's not supposed to be! It's accurate, it's not fun for them, and it's uncomfortable to see. You're not supposed to get off to Angel getting sexually assaulted by Val, you're supposed to see Angel's pain. Poison was quite literally the sh- <laughs> It was quite literally just showing the life of him in the studio, with so little control over what he can do, where, etc. Someone even pointed out that Angel's room has cameras in every corner of it. In other words, if you think this is a fetish, then you're a fucking idiot. Is Hasbun Hotel a perfect show? No. But with what Viv accomplished, and the way it had, I wouldn't have it any other way. I love Hasbun Hotel from the bottom of my heart because it has inspired me and hundreds of thousands like me. I've seen how Hasbun Hotel has given artists, editors, songwriters platforms. Without Hasbun, I wouldn't have found Honeycast. Oh, Michael. <laughs> I wouldn't have found about anything about indie animation, and that's only to name a few. I honestly could have said a lot more, but there is a lot to, like, talk about in this video. From Lilith's return, background cameos of to be seen characters, the countless theories swarming every character, to the amount my laptop can survive on. It barely survived the Nine Realms Season 8 video. But in summary, if you're 18 and up, I recommend giving this show a watch. And if you want, you can optionally watch the pilot. While most of it is questionably canon or not, still you'll get a basic summary of some of the characters' relationships, rivalries, and the starting story of the show. Because I think Hasman Hotel is a great addition to adult animation, alongside some of the greats like Invincible, Inside Job, and others. And I can't wait to see how much more of Hasman Hotel there is to come. Season 2 is going to be great. Spirit out.